her boss, I believe her name was Rose actually said, Oh, I don't know where your bathroom is. And she would have to keep on every single day, go a half mile to the other side of campus to be able to go to the bathroom. And there was a point when Al Harrison's like, where are you? What, where are you 45 minutes a day? I don't understand. And she's like, there are no colored bathrooms in this building or any building outside the West campus, which is half a mile away. Did you know that? And you people, you don't even want to drink from the same coffee pot as me. Mm-hmm. A really great scene. It's also a very lovely music sequence as well. And I'm going to go sort of um, chase sequence because she has to, she's, she's running to the toilet. And um, one of the things... Thank you so much, Ken, for joining. And today we're going to talk about the movie Hidden Figures. We are indeed very, very good film from about 2016, if I remember. Thanks for reintroducing me to this. I did go to the cinema to watch it. I suppose it's a bit, this is a, this is a big film. This is over two hours long. And the subject matter, it's pretty intense subject matter. So it, it deals with racial inequality in America during the 60s and beyond, uh, and obviously prior to that, and also deals with space race. So two pretty big subject matters running in parallel. I want to give you my assessment. So there are two main subject matters here. This is about race and about three female protagonists through black women in America who are, they're super brains, they're involved in mathematics, engineering, and computing, they are part of the space race during the early 60s. I think the film really concentrates on the first couple of years, 61, 62 mm-hmm. of the space race, when the Russians and the Americans are desperately trying to get a man into space and eventually a man on the moon. So, but the, the main the main tract of this film is about race and about the division of black and white within America, the inequality, the fact that blacks, as I see it, were regarded as second-class citizens. So they are segregated. So if you want to go for a drink at a public drinking fountain, they're all for coloreds and for whites. If you go on the bus, the back of the bus was for the coloreds, for blacks, the front of the bus was for the whites. Within terms of jobs and everything else, there was massive segregation, massive inequality. The film also slightly deals with the inequality of men and women also at the same time. Yeah, I mean, two very big subject matters. I think the film really works for me, how it's put together and how it treats these things. The race side of things is is kind of brought up in a very subtle kind of way, in a very gentle kind of way. You're just always led through the film as to the differences. It alludes to the riots. It alludes to the... The, the sort of the situation between the blacks and the whites, between how they are, how the, the black community, the colour community, because I'm not quite sure whether this applied to, say, Native American Indians, whether this applied to uh, maybe Indians from India and or me- Mexicans. And I don't know how it actually applied because we never had this in the UK. So for me, it's a bit of a difficult subject matter to deal with. The film has three main protagonists, and I'm going to use their screen names. We've got Catherine, we've mm-hmm. got Dorothy, and we've got Mary. The main protagonist is Catherine. The other two protagonists their struggle to gain acceptance, their struggle to progress within NASA is also very much part of the film. Less so than Catherine, but you do see these three women progressing through the film, fighting this barrier of race and gender as well, but it, it, it's a, a lot lower down the, the information level, but it's definitely in there. It starts with Catherine at school at about six, seven, eight years of age, and she's given a scholarship to go to another school because she's just a complete genius. It's a lovely little sequence where the teacher hands her um, a piece of chalk and asks her to do some mathematical equation, asks her to do some maths. In the, in the UK, maths are not math. math. 
Yeah, so maths. And she just picked, takes this piece of chalk and she goes up to the blackboard and she just starts this mathematical equation. It's so beautifully shot. The film's very beautifully shot. Uh, female camera, uh, well, DOP. I don't know, I didn't actually check who the camera operator was, but the DOP, Director of Photography, was a woman. Really nicely done. This, for, for a film which is very static, so it's in offices, it's in schools, it's in control centres, so there's no top gun sequence, there's no fight sequence, there's no car chase sequence. It's all offices, it's all internal or generally internal spaces, and it's very beautifully shot. It gave a lot of atmosphere, set stage, cars, beautiful, all of the era, looked very classy, very elegant, very nicely shot. And so that's the first sequence where you see this little eight, nine-year-old doing this mathematical equation. And I just stood, I sat there and just went, well, I have no idea what's going on. It's beyond me. So you realise that this, this young child is just streets ahead of everybody else. So, I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to leave it there and let you bring in the rest of the film. Yeah. So I, I thought definitely one of the things I liked about it is that it really was inspirational to me. I ended up bringing my daughter to see it in the film as mm -hmm. well, because you have these women that I think were, were making the first, not just for the race, but for gender as well, to be these mathematicians and really making a difference of figuring out all the all the trajectories and all the math that mm -hmm. was needed to have the first man the first human orbit the earth and mm -hmm. and and Katherine Johnson actually was was instrumental later on after the movie with the first man landing on the moon and yes. so we have Katherine Johnson who's that mathematician we have Dorothy Vaughn who is the supervisor that's not getting paid as a supervisor. She doesn't have the actual yeah. title, but she's working as a supervisor, but she also yeah. is teaching herself to run the IBM computers because the IBM computers, they just had bought and they didn't know how to use them, but she knew that she needed to learn how to use them and she needed to teach her girls, her, her um, people that were working under her, how to be the programmers because otherwise they would be without jobs. So she was teaching mm. herself how to do that. And then you have Mary Johnson, who was the engineer, but couldn't be couldn't have the title of an engineer because she was a black woman and she wouldn't yeah. be able to go and get the extra classes to be able to get that yeah. job. They were definitely all made a big impact in the space race. That was like one of the reasons that I picked it. And the other reason I picked it was that I really liked the message that it was it was like basically showing a time in history where we did have all of these segregations and the separation mm. and, and race problems and how at least it, at NASA, it seemed to be overcome because of all the contributions that these women were made. And we have Al Harrison who basically was like, all right, we're not going to have a different bathroom. We're not going to have a different coffee pot. We're just going to have, you know, one coffee pot for everybody to use because mm. everyone is making equal contributions to this. I'm going to slightly backtrack and come back into the film. I, the, one of the scenes I love is where they've broken down. The three ladies have broken down on their way to work. And that's really where you see the first mm, situation where they've broken down. They're trying to repair the car. It sets the scene. They've broken down. The police turn up and the police, are, this policeman is instantly quite mm, aggressive and quite unpleasant, I say, towards uh, the three black women. Uh, our three main protagonists, but they identify themselves as members of NASA. They're there helping the Americans get a man into space. And obviously at that particular point, you know, the communists, the uh, the Reds, the Ruskies, however they were referred to in that particular era, there was this massive, massive race to get, to be ahead, to be the first to actually achieve this task. And it's a lovely little scene, eventually, the, the police lead them to work, so they give them an escort to work, and they're just bumper to bumper. I think it's um, it's Mary who's who's driving this car. Three Negro women are chasing a white police officer down the highway in Hampton, Virginia, 1961. Ladies, that there is a God ordained miracle. It's a lovely scene. And it's a lovely quote, but it's I think that's the first real point where you realise that, you know, there's, there's this oppression, division, and instantly when the police turn up, you know, it's like, this is us and them, you are black, 
we are white, we are the police. But it's yeah, it was just it, it was just a great, a great, great scene for me, partially because I also love the cars. We're looking at the space race. So we got Paul Stafford, he's the the actor out of the Big Bang Theory, if I remember rightly. Yes. You've got Mrs. Mitchell, who's the boss of Dorothy. You've got Al Harrison, who I'm, I'm going to say something now before looking at the sort of having watched the film. I think he's just so blind outside of his task of getting a man into space, a man, that he doesn't, he's totally oblivious to everything around him until it's pointed out. I think he's just so, so tunnel vision that he just doesn't get it. He's got a massive task on his hands. He's got to get a man to the moon before, or he's got to get a man into space. Right, exactly. Before the Russians. So, And then you have uh, Catherine's boss, who I actually never picked up her name. It may have been mentioned, but I never picked it up. So, so the number of main protagonists is quite limited. There are other subplots. So Catherine has this love interest with a National Guardsman. Pastor mentioned you're a computer at NASA. What's that entail? We calculate the mathematics necessary to enable launch and landing for the space program. Yes, National Reserve or National Guardsman Jim Johnson. That's uh, okay. The, the, the subplot, so the, the character building side of the plot, those pieces of information which give the character a little more depth, give them more roundness, they just kind of dropped in. They're not, how do you put this? This. There is no substance to a lot of it. It's there just to let you know that they had a life outside of NASA, but you really don't get any empathy towards any of these characters. On the whole, they're just there. They kind of pass through. Even Catherine's children, they're there. You know she's got children, but there's no depth to any of that. It very much concentrates on this space race and upon the uh, racial conflicts, the racial issues in NASA and in America as a whole. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lovely kind of line from a Mr. Zielinski, who's a Polish Jew, whose family were exterminated in the, the concentration camps. And he does a lovely line to, I'm gonna to have to go back to Mary, who's the engineer. You know, so he, he kind of goes, you're, an, you're a, a black woman. You can do this, you can be an engineer. I have total faith in you. And I'm a Polish Jew whose parents died in a Nazi prison camp. Now I'm standing beneath a spaceship that's going to carry an astronaut to the stars. I think we can say, we are living the impossible. See, what, one thing he says, like, if you were, if you were a man, it may have been, if you were a white man, would you want to be an engineer? And she said, I would already be one. Being a, yes, yes. But I mean, he again, he doesn't he doesn't come into that film particularly. He just has this couple of one liners. So, yeah, the film really concentrates around a few, a few people, not that many. You know, the number of characters you have to deal with in terms of information is relatively limited. And again, I'm going to have to go back to my notes. Dorothy and Paul Stafford are you can see there's a real conflict. I think Paul Stafford, from the information I'm saying, is like, he probably won. He's got a real problem with women. Think probably more. He's got a problem with women more than he has a problem with black women because he just doesn't see them as equals in terms of mm -hmm. mathematicians. And you know, you see this through the film that there's this, there's this goal. He keeps going at Catherine when she keeps handing in these reports. Yeah, with and both of their name, both of their names on. She's been asked in the beginning to check all of his math and he's the lead yeah. engineer and he does not feel it needs to be done. So he blacks out. My numbers are spot on. I will double check them, sir. No problem. Tons of the information and says it's classified. And she's like, I, how can I work with this? I'm not going to be able work to. on what you can read. The rest is classified. You don't have clearance. Yep. She ends up holding it up to light and able to yep. figure out what the thing said. So she was able to find some errors in the math by by holding it up to light. I also want to like circle back to like another thing that was happening with the whole racing is that they're in the building that she moved to to work with the the team for the Friendship Seven, which was going to orbit the Earth. Mm -hmm. They had no bathrooms for colored people. Yeah. 
So when she asked to go the first day when she was there and she had asked to go to the bathroom, her boss, I believe her name was Rose actually said, Oh, I don't know where your bathroom is. And she would have to keep on every single day, go a half mile to the other side of campus to be able to go to the bathroom. And there was a point when Al Harrison was like, where are you? What, where are you 45 minutes a day? I don't understand. And she's like, there are no colored bathrooms in this building or any building outside the West Campus, which is half a mile away. Did you know that? And you people, you don't even want to drink from the same coffee pot as me. Mm -hmm. A really great scene. It's also a very lovely music sequence as well. And I'm going to go sort of um, chase sequence because she has, she's running to the toilet. Um, One of the things... Um, One of the things which is said is the dress code. High heels, skirt below the knees, a jumper rather than a blouse or something, and no no jewellery except a pearl necklace. And obviously, you know, this they cut these sequences a few times during the film where she's running to the toilets. There's no bath in it. There's no bath in the bathroom. It's just a toilet. <laughs> so, you know, this this little sequence where she has to get from her workplace to the toilet and then back again and as you say that brings in this situation where Al is asking where are you every day for 40 minutes or twice a day for 40 minutes and this is massive bit where she just explodes and explains to him what's been going on and explains she's not paid enough she's you know she, she can't wear a string of pearls because she's not even paid enough to basically survive etc cetera, etc cetera. and I think at this particular point Al's brains or Al's eyes kind of open up to realize there is more outside of the space race, which he he's like you know, he's totally, totally concentrated on. And he takes it upon himself since he is in charge of NASA by the sounds of it, if if I understand everything, and takes a crowbar and he just basically smashes down the, the toilet signs for the, which say you know colors, colors only kind of situation. Because he said, you know, he can't afford to have people away from their desks. You know, the, the toilets closest to the desks or the toilets they're going to use because, you know, the space race is the most important. The race race is unimportant. The space race, getting a man into space, getting a man to the moon, is more important than the race race. Here at NASA, we all pay the same color. <laughs> I mean, it is quite a clear film on the whole. Um, again, it's one of those films where music is used. It is music is used, but it tends to be used in sequences. It's not overlaid over dialogue. In terms of dialogue, there's a little bit of what I would assume was a Southern American accent. You are so there's that that little bit of sort of Southern draw. I only know it from films, so I'm going to have to really rely upon you to to give me a lead on that i'm assuming it's southern definitely the accent that's it's in virginia so langley virginia so there's a southern accent for virginia and then there's Mm. there's actually also probably a difference in the accents that you'll hear from the african-american and there's still that difference to this day that they they speak a little different than the than the white counterparts in the movie i mean there'll Mm -hmm. still be differences to to this day parts of the country and in that those accents as well so there is definitely uh Probably a challenge that some people might have on the accents. Yeah, I mean, for a native, I mean, I wasn't, I didn't struggle on on any of that. But you know, we we are reviewing these films for non-natives, so there is a slight, you know, there is a slight use of different accents and slightly different uses of the English language. So outside of the the, the slight Southern American draw, I mean, I'm going to go back to the race side of things. There's this lovely sequence where all the astronauts, the about six or seven astronauts, potential astronauts turn up and they're being introduced to all of the white employees. So they're shaking their hands, they're chatting. And I think it's John Glenn comes across and he comes across to all the black employees and starts to be introduced or introduce himself. Um, At this particular point, Mary has taken a liking to some of the astronauts and she makes some kind of remark that, hey, just because they're white doesn't mean to say that I can't find them attractive. Mm. And handsome must be a requirement too. How could you possibly be ogling these white men? Always equal rights. I have the right to see fine in every color. I can't remember the exact quote, but there's a lovely bit where he comes across to them. He strikes up a conversation or three main protagonists kind of give their job 
titles at NASA. What do you ladies do for NASA? Calculate your trajectories, launch and landing. Well, you can't get anywhere without the numbers. No, sir. And he's kind of dragged away in this, you know, he's into a very important meeting. But you kind of see John Glenn, and John Glenn, I think, comes out with this. He comes out of this, out of this film, with a great impression of somebody who's who's not bothered about race, he's not bothered about gender. He's, you know, he's he sees everybody as equals. And quite a few times through the film, there are some very pertinent things said by him in relation to the work that the women are doing and, and, and about Catherine and about her mathematical skills and about those mathematical skills getting him out into space and back safely again. And, you know, they dro it's dropped in quite a few times. He, he seems to be a really nice guy. I mean, I don't know how close that is to the truth. I did actually read that he did actually ask for Catherine to mm. um, recalculate the numbers because that was actually a true line that he asked her to recalculate the numbers for over the IBM because the IBM wasn't coming out right and that he trusted her numbers more than he trusted the computer's numbers. Yeah, there's a, there's a lovely sequence where she eventually manages to talk herself into a main meeting with all the, the top brass of the military and, and NASA. Paul Stafford, who's asked how fast the rocket's going, and he's just sitting there, Looking blank. And Catherine just pipes up, despite the fact she's been told to be quiet, she pipes up with the figure. Eventually, Al says to her, to do the mathematics. So there's this little sequence where she, the chalk is handed over, and it, it's almost a sort of carbon copy of the it first is. sequence at school. Catherine, have a go at it. where the, there's a huge shot of the chalk being taken out. She goes to the blackboard and she starts to do this mathematics and she's talking it through. There's a lovely line prior to that where John Glenn told her what speed it was. He said, that's one hell of a speeding ticket. Yeah. <laughs> but she goes through this whole mathematics thing and, and he just comes up with this line, you know, about how he totally trusts her after seeing this. It's like, yeah. Somebody's done this. Somebody knows what's going on and somebody can calculate things. And, you know, because it's my life on the line. It's the life of all of the astronauts. These people, you know, these, I'm going to say, these dull people with pencils and pens, these people who sit in rooms and calculate, these are not the sexy, sharp-end astronauts. These are the backroom boys and girls who who are there to make sure that all of this this, this machinery gets these people into space and back again alive. And he's very, I think he's very much aware that, you know, this is not a, this is a, this is a, this is a group effort. This is a massive group effort. You know, this, these hundreds and hundreds of people across many, many departments who were there to look after his life and the life of other astronauts to get them up, to get them down safely and to make sure it's done. So that he definitely comes across as a really nice guy. Yeah. So Dorothy, supervisor which she's not being paid as a supervisor mm. and there's the the whole interaction between her and mrs mitchell mrs mitchell's mm. always calling her dorothy and she's always yep. calling mrs mitchell mrs mitchell so there's obviously that whole thing where she's showing the respect but her boss mrs mitchell is not showing the same respect yeah. and basically she keeps on asking i put in to be a supervisor and she's told no i'm sorry you're not going to be able to be the supervisor even though you've been doing the work that's just the way things go at nasa but yeah. Dorothy knows it's because she's black. She ends up, like I said, I think said earlier that she discovers that there's this room of these IBM computers that are being installed. Yeah. It as its high speed storage unit and information holding device. Hmm. So you have a brain that I can work with. And she gets out some information but from Mrs. Mitchell that these are going to pretty much replace her and all the computers. The computers mm -hmm. being at that time, a computer was people doing math out by hand. Yeah. And so the IBM computers, the IBM mainframe computers would replace all of the computing division and all her girls. So she started to try to figure out that. She ended up going to a library and looking for a book on Voltran, the computer language. And then she mm -hmm. was told to leave the library very forcibly because yeah. she was not in the colored section. On the bus later on in the 
back of the bus because that's where yeah. other people had to sit. She takes out of her jacket the full turn book, and her kids are like, You took that from the library? Stole it. Yeah. And she's no, like, I, I paid, paid with it. I paid with it my taxes. Yeah, yeah, I paid for it with my taxes. So, and she yeah. used that book and her brains to be able to figure out. She figured out how to get that that IBM mainframe going while everyone else was having trouble with it and proven yeah. herself enough that she was given the supervisory position for the mainframe. But she said she wouldn't take it unless her, her girls could come with her. Cause she said, we're going to need, yeah. you're going to need women to be able to program this computer. It was cards. Like, and mm. I, the mm. big, huge computer takes up a whole room, not like our computers now that you oh, know, yes. now we have yeah. our computer that's the size of a phone that could do that has as, as much memory as that yeah. whole computer did and they would have tubes and all cards and all that kind of stuff so you needed to have people to program them and so she basically negotiated to have all of her girls get jobs so she saved their mm -hmm. jobs as well so and then we have mary jackson who's the yep. engineer um been trained in mathematics and science and was being encouraged by Carl Zizinski, who was the was the the engineer in charge of trying to figure out the all the fasteners and the heat shield for the capsule yeah. to to protect the astronaut when they're coming back in. When she yes. applied for the job, they changed the bar and they said you need to have extra classes that she couldn't take because they were being offered at a a white high school. Even oh, though we had yeah. gone through Brown versus Board of Education and there wasn't supposed to be segregation in the United States there still could be segregation on a state level. And there was segregation in, in Virginia. So she actually petitioned and won the right to be able to go mm. take those classes and became the engineer. So these three women, they, they were actually instrumental long after this, just a short period mm. of time. They were instrumental in, in the whole space race. And I believe the, the division that Catherine Johnson worked at is now named for her. The initial film was very much about race in America and the space race. But obviously, the other thing which is touched upon, because they're all women, is the inequality of women, the second class citizenship of women as well. But it is kind of, it isn't quite so much there, but because they're all women, you know, they're, they're touching upon these two subject matters at the same time. Um, I mean, this film is two hours and, you know, it doesn't feel like a two hour film. It really, it, it mulches us through in a really nice kind of way without being an action film. And it, it is having to condense, I believe, roughly a two year period. Um, so obviously they would have had to have taken some liberties to, to make this thing work in terms of facts and figures. So they would have had to just like take several of these bits and pieces, put them together to create something which, on the whole, gives a sense of roughly what happened over this period of time. I mean, it's, I mean, how much of this was written down? I think we've spoken about this uh, other factually um, based films where things have to be compressed to create one drama. Because reading the book, you've got a lot of information. This film has to entertain as well as educate, as well as inform. And it has to leave the audience coming out after two hours, feeling that it was worth spending two hours of their life watching. And it absolutely is. It's one of those films where, you know, having just watched it again twice, brilliant film. I, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed the, the, the content, the subject matter, all of the actors, brilliant. I mean, you know, I really felt... These people were real. They really gave it gave me a sense of portraying the real characters and how these characters change, how these characters' situations change over that roughly two year period, and how some of these characters change their reaction to each other. So, as you were saying earlier, Dorothy and her supervisor. There's a little, little sequence in the in the toilets bathrooms, sorry, bathroom, where there's this mirror sequence. Lots of films have mirror sequences or have reflection sequences. And they have this chat and you suddenly realise that Dorothy's supervisor is starting to work out. They are equal. They are equal. As is the case with Catherine's supervisor as well, where, again, there's a little sequence you suddenly realise, yes, she's starting to work out that 
there is an equality, there is no division or the division, the, the perceived division really isn't there. Okay. There's also a little sequence, of course, with uh, with Paul Stafford and Catherine. There's a little, almost at the end of the film, where he brings her a cup of coffee and puts the cup of coffee down in front of her. And she's typing her name, which he mm. never would allow her to put her name. Yeah. Computers don't author reports. But at that yes. point, she's putting the name, she hands it to him, and he hands her a coffee. Yeah, yeah. And you suddenly realize, you know, he's... You'd assume that he has recognized the fact that not only as a woman, but as a black woman, she is as equal to him because personally, I think she's suspect she's a better mathematician than he was. She was absolutely certainly his equal. I mean, there's all these lovely sequences of her climbing up the ladder on the blackboard and doing all these mathematical equations. You mentioned something earlier about stuff being underlined, and you kind of understand that. You understand. Uh, secret stuff, stuff which can only be given to people, because I've got a friend who's in the military and he was only allowed to read certain things and not other things. So I kind of get that. And I, I don't think that was specifically aimed at, at Catherine, but I, you know, it was a case of really just not looking at it and going for Catherine to do her job, for Catherine to check his maths, for Catherine really to assess all of the information she needed all of the information, so she had to be privy to all the information and not allowing her and people like her across the board not to have the information really makes it difficult to do your job. If you're not allowed the base information, how the hell do you do your job? How the hell do you assess a situation like that, which is so complex if all, if all you have is just scraps of information? So, yeah, it's nice to see how the relationships between the main protagonists and their opposing protagonists changes during the film. Yeah, absolutely. And and to just circle back a little bit, like when the the information was being blacked out, mm. at one point she was questioned, how did you know about this? That was classified. Mm. That wasn't <laughs> and she's like, well, I held it up to the light. And so they kind of questioned her whether or not she was a Russian spy. And she's like, no, I'm not Russian. I'm not a spy. And Al Harrison pretty much agreed. She's not a spy. She figured this out. She figured out the errors in it. And he also mentioned that they need to get darker ink. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. There's, I mean, weirdly enough, there's some quite nice, very subtle pieces of humor dropped in through this film. Just little one-liners. They're not, they're not sort of raucous laughing things. You just kind of chuckle because it's such a nice little line. I kind of like that kind of humor because. You know, it's it, it's 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 not a comedy. It's not a comedy, but you know, there are half a dozen little lines just thrown in where you just you chuckle to yourself because it's just a nice little one-liner. And you're right. In that sequence, he says, "She said she's not a Russian," or something to that effect. You know, and just you just start to chuckle because it's like, yeah, it's just a nice one-line throwaway piece of light humor. Yeah, yeah. So overall, like, I hope that you enjoyed it. I think it was a a really good film for many aspects. Like we said, the space race, the race relations in the United States at the time, NASA, gender inequality is, I think it has yeah. a lot of, I felt it to be a very inspirational film to women in general, never mind to people of different races as well, because they, the people that were the African American woman made such a difference and mm -hmm. were so instrumental in particularly that first orbit of a man around the earth. I mean, you could take it outside of the race and the gender thing and just about those people who are told you can't do something. Hell, you can. You know, why not? Why should somebody say you can't do something, especially when quite evidently you can? You have the skills. You have the intelligence. And that those, those skills could be physical. Those skills could be mental. So, yeah, a really, a really lovely, lovely film and absolutely recommended. Even at two hours, it whizzes by that, that two hours just... Because you get involved in the characters, you get involved in the whole race, 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 race. There's lots of races going on in this film. So it's it's a really nice film. Totally, thoroughly, thoroughly recommend it to everybody. Now, I'm going to tr backtrack slightly, you know, in terms of the humour within this film, which is very subtle and just dropped in. Do you want to know my next film? Yes, I would like to you know wanna... your next film. Yeah, you know, okay, so it's about space. Oh, well, that's a good choice. It's, and it's a, it's a very 
gentle comedy from Australia, a, a country which doesn't, a bit like the UK, its film industry normally doesn't have multi, multi million pound, multi, multi, multi million dollar budgets. They're normally quite low budget, but they have a real history of, of pumping out some very, very good films. So for our next film, Continuing with the theme of NASA, we have we have the dish. The dish. We have the dish. The dish, yeah. Which is about involves the Apollo 11 launch. Oh wow. And yeah, so it's about NASA and it's about the broadcasting of information, television signal to the world during the Apollo missions. This is a lovely little Australian film which revolves around a slight conflict between the Australians and the Americans. I'm going to say no more. It's a few years since I've seen it, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. Slight Australian accent. Very nice film. A comedy dealing with NASA. All right. I like the choice, and I'll have to search on Amazon or eBay and find myself a copy. Fantastic. Well, until the next time, thank you very much for a fantastic film, and I hope you enjoy the dish. All right. I will. Thank you. Thank you.